there's one video game that truly managed to blend my two all-time favorite genres, it's a little game called Little Nightmares. Horror platformers are something we mostly saw in 2D for the longest time, games like Limbo and Inside being some of the earliest go-to examples. There's something about the pacing and camera movement of a side-on game like this that allows you to frame all sorts of haunting scenes, ones with god-tier composition. Little Nightmares brought that sort of idea into a 3D space, with platforming that felt like a comfy union of the size and moveset of Little Big Planet and the more realistic physics, jumping and climbing of games like Uncharted. You were crawling and climbing and jumping all over these gigantic set pieces, all of which were clearly meant for characters big and scary enough to squish you like a bug. It was made by Tarsier Studios, a Swedish team known for their additional work in the Little Big Planet series and some original games as well, like Static, which is to this day still one of the most interesting VR games I've ever played. And their work on Little Nightmares? Oh, it was something magical. Watching them take that familiar tiny little vibe and transform it into this dollhouse of a nightmare even having the camera pull way out just for you to see how small and insignificant you are in this gigantic, unkind world. Easily one of the best surprises of 2017, at least for me, because it was the year where like 5,000 amazing games were all coming out at once. Really good year for my two favorite genres, and then it just blew me away seeing this charming little thing just land right in the middle of all that. It was so up my alley that I immediately fell in love with it. It's incredible monster design, chilling and beautiful set pieces, and super fun gameplay were only really undermined by the fairly short length, only about two and a half hours long. Though I guess the DLC is pretty decent and does managed to double that length. I especially love the second one, where you gather up these little gnomes and use them all like Pikmin. But as much as it did leave me wanting a lot more, the short length did at least make it something I was able to regularly come back to over the years, and yeah, I am still in love with this thing. Upon each replay, I'd try to piece together a little bit more about what the hell could be happening on screen. It is a game with no dialogue or real story, after all. It's more about observing the world and getting an idea of what this place could be. And I feel like this is a world that channels a class struggle, the gluttons benefiting off of the exploitation of the small and weak, gorging themselves at the horrid expense of others, all organized by a tall, mysterious mistress who bears unfathomable power. Yeah, the powerful destroying the lives of the powerless just for their mildest of pleasures. Your entire existence doesn't matter at all because I want a yummy treat and I'll destroy an entire life every time I want it. We even see Six getting a glimpse of this power at taking the form of hunger in this world. The more she eats, the more she likes it, the more she wants it, the more she'll try to get it, the more she stops caring about who she has to hurt. To me, I feel like it's less about trying to follow some sort of plot and more about, like, personifying all of the little horrors of the real world. So, like, for example, let's say you're really stressed about a deadline. You might have a dream about a countdown to the end of the world. You didn't have that dream because you're afraid of the end of the world, but because your brain took that real-life stress surrounding a time limit and exaggerated it into the worst version of that fear. That's a little nightmare, don't you think? I could gush about this game for a pretty long time, and I find it criminal that my review of it back when it came out was so short and shallow, because Little Nightmares is short, but it sure as hell ain't shallow. I was really surprised to see them announce a sequel. It felt like such a small one-off thing, you know, but knowing that I'll finally get to see more of this nightmare world I'm so in love with, it has me very excited. The first game left me so hungry for more, dude, so let's dig in, shall we? Ooh, title screens already give me a lot to wonder about, man. Oh, we've seen the Maw, but now we're seeing the world outside of it. What a city looks like here. It's, it's one of those title screens where you just look at it and you're like, oh, I can't wait to go there. We open up with a long, drawn-out shot of this door. You might recognize that eyeball from the first game, this theme of surveillance that was once tucked under the covers and now becomes one of the main themes explored here. We wake up in this forest that's littered with these abandoned TVs. Oh, there's our new protagonist, Mono. A while Six had this bright yellow jacket, Mono's got a cute little bag on his head instead. His design feels more in tune with shame. Or, or no, maybe secrets? Yeah, secrets. Why is he hiding his face? What could he be hiding? You know, come to think of it, a lot of these characters had bags in their heads. Uh, the chefs with their fake burlap faces you'd occasionally realize weren't real whenever they'd reach under the hood to grab a bite. The janitor too, obscuring his face as much as he could with cloth. That's a motif that continues on in this game. Characters concealing their true faces. Maybe they have something to hide, or maybe Maybe they're hiding from something. Who can say? 
All right, so the gameplay is pretty much identical to the first one, a move set and all. You can run and jump and sneak around, and of course, in Little Big Plan of Fashion, use the R2 button to grab objects, also allowing you to climb stuff. Once again, the game takes on this playhouse look, as if we're cutting into a slice of the building, or a tunnel, viewing it side on from a low angle. I love when games do this sort of thing, because on top of being a really cool way to compose each environment, it also gives the developers a lot of control over optimization. Since I don't have to worry about the player turning the camera and making the game render more objects, right? It's why Luigi's Mansion 3 looks so damn good, and it's why Little Nightmares 2 is a visual splendor. When it comes to the phrase, every frame of painting, Little Nightmares 2 more than rivals the best of its contemporaries. The first game did have some amazing environments, but oh, they really outdid themselves here. Yo, like I was really hoping we get to see more of this world, and Little Nightmares 2 delivers. And no longer are we only limited to indoor environments. The mall was a really cool setting, but no, now it's time to see what the rest of the world's like. What cities are like, schools, how people live. What sorts of awful things can we expect from day-to-day -day society? I swear to God, there is not a single screen of this game that I don't want to just stare at and take in. The atmosphere is once again just incredible, dude. Like, from the on-point sound design to the way the light carefully casts on the back of stuff, often creating a convenient outline to help see your character. That's actually something I was wondering how they tackle. I guess last time they used a bright yellow character that was easy to spot in the dark, but no, here they chose a design that's much darker, and that forced them to get crafty, figure out a different way to make them stand out. And for that, they're actually using a fairly simple lighting technique. Now, uh, usually when you're like filming stuff, you usually want three-point lighting. Uh, that's when you have the main light, the fill light, and the backlight. And the backlight here is what's important, so uh, let's get two of these guys turned off, just the main light. Now we have a scene where I'm a character wearing a dark shirt on a dark background. Uh, kind of difficult to make out where I am now, you know, you don't I don't know where's where and what's what. I look like a floating head and hands, like I'm bongo bongo off of Zelda. But now, if we cast a soft light just over the shoulders behind the neck, it gives us a bright outline. Now the viewer can see exactly where the character is at all times, even if the subject is still mostly in the dark. Now, it's one thing if you're watching a movie, but if you're controlling a character in a game, it's even more integral that you're able to see them clearly at all times. Simply put, if you can't see your guy, you're probably gonna die. But thanks to the game's very careful and deliberate lighting, Mono usually does have that outline. And if he doesn't, they'll make sure to make the background brighter instead, turning him to a clear silhouette. That's a bold decision, man. Like, uh, ditching the solution that's way easier that they already know works in favor of something that's way harder to execute? But they stick the landing, dude. Mad respect. Even down to how they use the background elements to affect the gameplay this time. That new sense of depth is something they do play a lot with. Like a hunter wandering around far back. Washing his flash lantern over the foreground as we hide and try to escape. Or a teacher in a library walking behind a bookshelf as we tiptoe through. It's something I really loved about Inside. Using those background elements to paint a world that extends beyond what you're playing. But in a meaningful gameplay way that feels like you're still interacting with it. And that also helps draw our attention to the backgrounds more often. Once you start putting things that can affect you back there, the player will think more about back there, thinks more about the world. You think about the details, like, uh, seriously, what's with all the TVs? And that's a big part of creating a believable world in this style, when these elements of it interact and get the player's brain gears turning. Now they complement each other, instead of existing on separate planes of reality and just being a nice visual behind the gameplay. You'll find yourself doing many of the same things you did in the first game. Lots of climbing, tons of simple physics puzzles, usually involving having to pick up and throw stuff, but uh, they find new ways to make it interesting, like tossing shoes around to set off any traps before you walk forward. I always love that feeling of just grabbing whatever's laying around and trying to use it somehow. You're coming with me, buddy man. In many parts of the game, you'll also have an AI-controlled partner to help you solve each puzzle, giving you boosts, helping you make jumps. It's all scripted and works well, but I don't think it adds like a ton to the gameplay. It is cool seeing these two interact, and that certainly adds a lot to the overall experience, a lot of endearing moments with it, but it mostly just kind of made me wish the game was two player. You can also now use weapons you can find, often something like a hatchet clearly meant for a character much bigger than you. It feels great to use, just grabbing these oversized objects and like the weight of it dragging behind you as you lift it up and slam it down on your enemies. Oh, it feels good. 
I guess combat isn't something entirely new, they did experiment a little bit with it in the DLC of the first game, uh, sort of, and it is a welcome addition to this game too. It feels kind of like that uh, Silent Hill sort of combat, the kind that's slow and clunky but isn't too hard to get the feel for, just enough sluggishness to make you worry about the timing, keeping you on your toes, and giving the combat a lot of good challenge. It does still use a pretty forgiving checkpoint system though, so don't expect the levels of tenseness you'd get from other horror games. If you mess up, you'll be fine. Though it does feel pretty good getting payback on these little twerps after they've harassed me so much. You can even get crafty and use their own traps against them, which is always super satisfying to do. The combat's not like a constant throughout the game or anything, it comes and goes as sequences call for it, and I feel like they sprinkled it throughout the game just enough to add a lot of variety without pulling too much focus away from the platforming. A balanced platformers often struggle to find in my experience. Like the first game, every area will introduce a new monster that you'll have to deal with, and they got way more of them this time, man. Each one is once again genuinely freaky as hell. Tons of amazing designs here, especially the teacher, dude. I think most people will agree she takes the cake. I love how the monsters all interact with the light this time. A mannequins that move when you take the flashlight off of them, or this guy climbing around the ceiling and casting a bulky shadow across the room as he fumbles about. This series is known for its impressive lighting effects, so it's very cool seeing them do even more with it. No, 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 no. Oh, the stealth sections are so much more tense now, dude. Oh my god. They, they really make you get out of your comfort zone and be really on the move. The scramble, dude. It's like the beginning of freaking Ratatouille. The very forgiving checkpoint system can take away from some of the challenge sometimes, though. Most times it's fine, but there will be times where you'll like sprint into a room after being chased by these guys, die, and then just load you back in that room without having to do it for real. Kind of cheap, if you ask me. The school is full of these feral children that have nothing inside their heads once they're smashed open. That's unsettling. And the city, full of abandoned clothes, as if the people wearing them just like vanished into thin air and the people that remain mind controlled obsessed with the television that brainwashes them you see a lot of those tvs throughout the game abandoned everywhere destroyed were people starting to catch on? And the hunter in the woods, he's got this fake family set up at the dinner table. They're all made of like cloth and stuffing. Did he lose his family to the TV? Did he leave society to the woods where it was safer? Maybe that's why he wears a bag on his head to protect himself from control. Is that why the chefs wear bags? I mean, is that why Mono wears a bag? <laughs> so many questions. My favorite puzzles come into play once you get the remote control. Once you control the TVs, you control them. The source of the control seems to be this tall man who pursues you in six throughout the game. He's clearly the authority figure that controls all. He's the most powerful being in the entire game, and a lot of imagery associates his image with the television. The TV is controlled because it broadcasts him and he is who controls. Mono seems to be the only one who's not only unaffected by the brainwashing power, but also has the ability to control it. <laughs> Mono is such a great foil to Six, dude. Like, even his design contrasts her really nicely. Not just the stark difference in brightness and color, but also the choice in clothing. Mono wears a bag on his head while a Six sports a rain jacket. What do jackets do? They protect you from the elements, but a bag, a bag hides something. Very much in line with the goals of either character. <laughs> Mono's willingness to help others and his determination to make a positive change to such a bleak world hugely contrasts Six's selfish desires that gradually overtake her. Okay, so like, I, I kind of want to talk about the ending real quick because it touches up on that point, and I think it's really interesting, but it, it does spoil a major set piece of the game that's really cool to play through, so uh, uh, please skip this if you want to play the game, and I, I highly recommend you play the game because this game is like super good. Alright, so uh, you know, like Six just wanted to escape the Maw, right? She's clearly a victim of some sort of system that exploits people like her for the big boys. And that awful experience robbed her of all humanity. It makes it so easy to go down that path, gathering power and abusing it, once your bitter perspective makes you cease to value the world around you. Now my boy Mono, on the other hand, no, he don't operate like that. No, he is the shimmer of hope in this broken world. He's not running away like Six is. No, you start safe. He goes to them. It's the opposite this time. And I think it's because he knows he has this power and he wants to be the one to use it responsibly. Be the only one to attempt to make things better for people other than himself. In the final sequence, we visit the tower broadcasting a TV signal. The inside being a timeless limbo where Six's power corrupts her so much it turns her into a gigantic monster clutching this music box. I like to think this music box represents Six holding on to temptation. She's holding it when we first meet her and she ditches it to form a bond with Mon and in the final fight, destroying it reverts her back to normal. But despite his efforts, Six ultimately rejects him, taking advantage of his kindness to pursue more of that delicious power. 
In that betrayal, it had Mono tumbling into that timeless, dimensionless void where he grew old and more powerful. Absolutely powerful. Absolutely corrupt. Warping back in time to exact his revenge on Six, the cycle begins anew, just as it always has and always will. What a game, dude. A Little Nightmares 2 effectively expands the world of the Maw, revealing a society that carefully extracts power from the people and gives it to the corrupt. The schools and hospitals existing not to teach and heal, but to remove their humanity and replace it with the mechanical parts that make that factory turn, punishing anyone who doesn't willingly follow along. Well, looks like somebody was being bad. I guess this kid didn't like being watched. The game will even poke fun at you for getting all the achievements. When you put it that way, it's kind of dull. <laughs> Face it, genius, you've been played. Oh, look like again, it takes all those subtle horrors of the real world. Corruption, addiction, control, fear of the powerful, and uses it all to paint a gorgeous hellscape. And like any painting, it's the sort of thing that's fun to stare at and try to interpret something from it. And I guess that's also part of the beauty of this thing. The game could be some sort of funny allegory, or it could just be the story of uh, two friends trying to escape a nightmare. The game still doesn't have any real dialogue or story, so it's on the player to decide what it all means. You know, I tried dissecting the themes a little bit, but I think there's still a lot of lore here we can have fun trying to figure out. So hey, if you gave this thing a run through and you got some fun ideas of your own, uh, feel free to post them down below in the comments. I would really love to see that. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting moving pieces here that are really fun to try and put together. Uh, but again, the game is totally open to interpretation. There's no right or wrong answers. I just want to inspire people to try and come up with some fun theories. Games available on pretty much everything, uh, PS4, Xbox One, PC, uh, coming to PS5 and uh, X series later. It's also on Switch too. Oh man, I remember the Switch board of the first game. Really hard to recommend that thing. I mean, it, like, it runs pretty fine and even looks really good too, but uh, the long load times are such a deal breaker. They're excruciating. It's a game where you die a lot too, so the waiting quickly becomes straight up intolerable. And yes, we're still waiting. We're still waiting. Yes, it actually takes this long. Okay, you know what, let's just, how about we put you down there and then we'll just keep going. Luckily, the load times are way better for two Switch port. Oh, look at that, perfect. This port also performs pretty well and doesn't sacrifice any of those fancy lighting effects or anything, but I can't help but the feel that despite the game looking very, you know, true to the other versions, it just looks so blurry now. A little bit hard to make out some of the objects you have to interact with when you're playing it portably, so honestly, unless a Switch is your only choice, I'd recommend the other versions of both games instead. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, that is literally how long it takes every single time you die. Not worth it. No amiibo unlocked Pac-Man costume is going to make me wait through that. And it's pretty cool though. Speaking of costumes, second game has way better collectibles. The first one had like collectibles for the Sega collectibles, you know, just for that replayability, which I don't have a problem with, and they are here too, giving you an extra scene at the end if you get them all. But on top of that, there's also all these hats you can find and wear. You'll get to plop some really funny stuff on Mono's head. It's really cute. I always appreciate some uh, fun, unlockable cosmetics. One of these hats is DLC, and another one was a pre-order bonus, and hey, that's fine. I normally do not have a problem with that, but it is pretty annoying having them take up slots on the screen even though I do not have that content. Especially this one, like I didn't pre-order the game so I have no way of getting it. The screen just has to look incomplete forever even though I got everything I could. The game also costs a little bit more than the first one, uh, 30 bucks US, 40 Canadian, uh, but it is also a much longer game, about 5 hours this time. It's still not amazing, and I'm not sure everyone's going to be happy with that price point. But either way, this is still going to be a game that I replay again and again over the years, just like the first one. It's a short but sweet experience, and I love it every bit as much as I did the first one. Perhaps even more! If you enjoyed the first game, it's a no-brainer, but maybe wait for it to go on sale if you're not already a really big fan. Little Nightmares 2 hits it out of the frickin' park, dude. Like, they really do everything I was hoping they would. You got new terrifying monsters, lots of amazing looking environments that are practically interactive paintings, a lot of spooky themes to get my brain gears going, and of course, you get to see tons more of the world, which is what I wanted more than anything. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Easy recommendation to anybody that likes short and spooky games, because, man, I tell ya, nightmares have never looked so damn good. Hey sports fans, thanks for watching my review about this video game by me, a pizza delivery. If, if you if you want to support the channel, I have a $1 podcast on Patreon that like sucks ass. If you want that, I mean, I don't know. It's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but it's alright.